Chapter 40, Sonic Radboom. If you're feeling lonely, and you're still searching for your true friends, just look up at the sky. Who knows? Maybe you are all looking at the same rainbow. Loss. The war had come with thunder and death, and all of the equestrian wasteland seemed in mourning. We were deep in our darkest hour, just praying for a ray of light. We had all suffered loss. My friends and I had lost one of our own, Steel Hooves. He had finally found a rest, finally been reunited with his beloved Applejack and their child in whatever life lies beyond this. But all I felt was the gaping wound of his absence, an absence in the core of our party, aching and hollow, where Steel Hooves should have been. The specter of his death hung over everything, casting all our individual losses into an even deeper shadow, making us all seem more vulnerable and fragile. I was struggling with the loss of my very self. I was not who I was anymore. Not little Pip. I was an alien in my own body. A body wrapped into something entirely non-pony by taint. And I was a stranger in my own mind not knowing the truth of these things I had done. Velvet's words had cut cruelly, not because she was cruel, but because she was right. The Balefire Bomb had been an atrocity, and yet, as Velvet Remedy had assured me, it had been the necessary thing to do. Without my memories, I didn't know if I had simply never thought of the consequences, or if I had, and went ahead anyway. Steelhoofs had paid the price. He had lost his life because of what I had done. I knew I would never watch those memories. Well, maybe the eighth memory orb. My soul needed homages every healing touch. But the others? Probably not. I didn't want to know how much I had realized. If I had committed a holocaust, I couldn't bear it. It would be the final Fatal separation from self. Velvet Remedy was suffering with a loss of faith. Velvet was hurting more deeply than the rest of us. The foundation of all that she was had been shattered. The wasteland was more cold and cruel and brutal than any pony should ever have to bear. Too much for a pony whose soul was one filled with kindness and caring for others. whose core desire was to help heal and to make things better. To her, it didn't matter if the hurting creature was a pony, a zebra, or a monster. Friend, stranger, or enemy were all worthy of the same compassion in Velvet Remedy's eyes. I remembered her considering a hellhound, a patient, and easing the pain of a dying alicorn. Velvet Remedy had weathered all the equestrian wasteland had to throw at her, sometimes weakening but never failing in her belief that helping others was the right course of action. And she had done so, fighting both the despair and ugliness of the wasteland and her own inner demons by clinging to her personal religious of Fluttershy. The kindness of the Mayor of Peace had been her anchor and her bulwark. Now, the memories of Steelhoofs had revealed the truth to Velvet Remedy, and that bulwark had been shattered and she was drowning. Calamity was fighting against loss of all he held dear, and he felt he was losing the battle. Already one of his friends was dead, and he could see those he held most dear, including the mare he loved, slipping away into their own darkness. And that horror played out against the black drop of the entire world. After meeting one of Calamity's brothers, and seeing hints that the rest of his family were as bad or worse. I found Calamity's policy and his personal honor over Buckland Cross were brought into sharp focus. Calamity was my closest friend, and I was only now beginning to understand and truly know him. And now the Enclave had descended upon us with Operation Cauterize. It was one thing for Calamity to have rejected and left the Enclave but it was quite another for him to witness the Enclave rise up 
as the greatest threat to Equestria. Like us, Applejack's rangers had lost steel hooves. He had been their elder and their center, the figure around whom they had gathered. Now, the fledgling force, for good, faced a harrowing fight to survive. And it was not only us. All of the equestrian wasteland was suffering. With the destruction of Canterlot, the ponies of the wasteland had lost the greatest symbol of the fabled past of peace and tranquility that the era had before the war. It was as if the final strands of the past had been severed with the death of Steelhoofs and the destruction of that city. The proof of what we had once been had carried it with the silent promises that we could, possibly, be that again. Now, we were adrift in a sea of darkness. Within the same day, the wasteland had lost more than an icon. We had lost one of our greatest centers of pony kind with the bloody massacre of Friendship City. We had lost what little peace the wasteland had to offer. We had lost the reinsurance that even those living within the walls of a fortified city would live another day. All across to Crestia, ponies mourned for the dead and feared for the living. As if those wounds were not deep enough, the ponies of the wasteland had lost the voice that called out to them in the darkness, bringing truth and hope. The voice of DJ Pwn3. But in this, at least, the loss was not absolute. How much was out there? Fighting back. The voice of DJ Pwn3 would occasionally cry out within the darkness, bringing a flicker of light before it was silenced. And even our enemies had suffered a great loss. The Alicorns had lost their goddess, their guide and compass. They had lost the unity which connected them and gave them purpose. They had lost the constant voice in their heads to which they had been subservient. And even now, many were beginning to lose their minds. The Hellhounds, the most vicious and deadly of all monsters in the wasteland, had the heart of their civilization torn asunder and the bulk of their kind annihilated in a single blast of necromonic green fire. <clears throat> Psychotically ter territorial, they now no longer had a home of their own. And the Enclave themselves, they had lost one of their leaders, and a great many of the ponies, in what was, to them, a cowardly and heinous terrorist attack. How much of their overkill was fueled by the rage and grief of a wounded nation? Operation Crotterize was costing them more than they were ready to lose. They had not anticipated the resistance they would encounter, either from without or within. Their victories had been <clears throat> pyrrhic at best. The Pegasi were facing not only loss of forces, impossible defeat, but for many, a loss of ideology as well, and it only promised to get worse the longer they stayed here. Of all those in the wasteland, perhaps only Red Eye had yet to suffer a loss, but that would soon change. Loss. It doesn't bring out the best in us, or the worst, although it can do either. It doesn't show us who we truly are, it just hurts, and it makes us all the same. Even the most sadistic raider, impure and immune to empathy, who draws joy and strength from the suffering of others, will feel grief over a loss they suffer themselves. In the black pit of loss, we all pray for light. Ditsy Doo exploded, and the explosion was massive. The center of the explosion was a glorious greenish gold, so bright it seemed to sear my eyes, lingering in my vision long after I had looked away. From that epicenter erupted a ring of spectral light, riding an enormous shockwave, rippling with strange colors like a toxic rainbow. The missiles chasing Ditsy Doo were bucked backwards, 
exploding into the air yards behind her. Molten payloads discharged in plumes of Eltridge Hellfire, burning the sky above and below Ditsy Dew. But even as they missed, the force of the twin detonations slammed into the ghoul like she was made of rags. Ditsidu's body somersaulted, peppered with shrapnel, and plummeted, unconscious or dead, towards the ground. She was no longer glowing. But the burst of fire and energy from the missiles were barely noticed in the fury of what, was Ditsy, or what Ditsy Do had unleashed. The ear-splitting crack of her feet drowned out their pitiful explosion. The shockwave blasted through the air, tearing off roofing from a few buildings in New Appaloosa, not made of train cars, scattered debris, and torn the Enclave Pegasi out of the sky. Well, there's only one way to clear that area that big, that fast, Calamity once told me when I asked about removing part of the cloud curtain. And that's with a sonic rain boom. The realization struck me as what I was seeing, half forming in my brain, as the shockwave knocked out four enclave raptors from the city, as the ring of unearthly light washed over them, tearing away their clouds. The raptors used clouds as an integral component for their locks, their computers, structural equipment, and the storm clouds that kept them aloft. The mighty enclave warships crumbled as they fell, three crashing down just beyond the city's walls. The fourth was not pushed so far away, its corpse dropping towards homes and ponies below, until a caramel-colored field of levitation magic caught it, and nudged it away with just enough that it struck down on a durable assemblage of boxcars just left of Turnpike Tavern. Even as my mind was putting a name to what I was seeing, I lashed out with my magic, tossing a levitation net under Ditsy Doo's limp body, wrapping her in it. She was falling so fast I knew I wouldn't be able to stop her from splattering against the ground, but I had to try. Two more levitation fields wrapped around my own. A powerful one, of a familiar caramel color and weak glow of palest silver. Even the three of us could not stop her fall only slow her down just a little. Just enough for Calamity to catch her. Even as Calamity burst through our levitation fields, four legs outstretched, the body of Ditsy Doo cradled within them. The shockwave reached the heavens, tearing open the sky. Sunlight, the purest and most brilliant light imaginable, illuminated New Appaloosa in a warm glow. It was as if Celestia herself had descended from the heavens and was giving the city a hug. Shimmering colors floated in the air, a heavy storm clouds releasing their moisture as they dissipated. My pip up began click, clicking with a gentle warning. The rain was irradi irradiated, toxic. While I could not see it for myself, I now know how far Ditsy Doo's miracle reached. Inside the walls of New Appaloosa, Xena stood transfixed at the edge of a scrap metal walkway, the hood of her cloak down, eyes lifted upwards towards the wonder above us. She was too distracted by the marvel above her to stop the lavender little filly, her newly grown horn growing with a pale silver light, as she dashed between the Zokora's legs, galloping towards where Calamity was now just landing. But her ears caught the filly's cry. Mommy! Ditsy Doo's sonic rain boom, radiation boom, didn't stop at the edges of New Appaloosa. I spun, watching the expanding ring of Ditsy Doo's explosion, a rainbow of glorious and diseased colors tearing outward, riding the shockwave that carried dust and debris like it was a storm. The sonic rad boom blasted over the Everfree Forest, clearing the smoke and fanning the flames it didn't blow out. The shockwave rattled the windows of the cathedral. I am sure that, in that moment, Red Eye paused to look out at the sky, realizing something important had happened. The blast was felt in Ponyville, driving the beleaguered town's newest inhabitants underground. The toxic rainbow flushed out over Splendid Valley, driving a great radioactive wind before it. The wash of strange light fanned out 
beneath the clouded sky. Looking up from the gravestone before which she was grieving, a charcoal-cold unicorn watched as the light mirrored across the lake behind Stilu's shack. The thundering crack of the sonic radboom echoed through the gray canyons of the Manhattan ruins. Staring out through his office window in Temponi Tower, a mottled brown unicorn with a scroll on his flank watched as the sunlight spilled down on a town far away, the golden glow reflecting in his glasses. Even amongst the cold, windswept crags of Shattered Hoof Ridge, where the storm clouds were unleashing their flurry of summer snow, the glow of Ditsy Dusonic Rainboom was visible on the monitors inside the base's station of Shattered Hoof Ridge Tower, lighting up part of the horizon in a pulse of weird luminescence. And just outside of town, this little unicorn mare with a pit buck on her flank was finally feeling the pieces of that great puzzle slide into her into place in her head. I had spent my life searching for who I was, trying to find meaning in my existence. As a filly, I yearned to discover my cutie mark, needing to know what made me different and special, if anything at all. Outside, my search evolved into a quest to find my virtue, and ultimately, my place in this vast and cruel wasteland. Now, in the light given to us by Ditsy Do, I began to see. As each piece slid into place, they began to reveal to me that I had spent my life long longing for purpose. I levitated myself over the wall of New Appaloosa. I didn't care that I was banned from the city. Not now. Clementine had just landed inside, cradling Ditsy Doo. My heart was screaming. I didn't know if she was alive or dead. I had already lost Steel Hooves just two days ago. I didn't think I could bear to lose another friend. Not so soon. I landed on the puddle covering the ground inside and galloped towards where Calamity sat on a set of railroad tracks, bathed in sunlight, Ditsudu's body resting in his forelegs. There was Icker bleeding from the innumerable small wounds. Silverbell and Zenith were gathering close to him. The others began forming a circle. If Railwright wanted to kick me out, let him try. My heart was pounding as I reached Calamity, my eyes filling with tears as I watched the Pegasus ghoul praying to Celestia and Luna for any sign of movement, of life. My mind flashed to Velvet Remedy holding steel hooves, and the sobbing started. The rain out felt strange against my coat, but the warmth, the true light of the sun, was too majestic to take cover inside. My gaze drifted upwards to the crystalline blue of the hole above us, a yawning upness that went on forever. Unlike that starry night sky, which I had first glimpsed through breaks in the clouds on my first wasteland night, this sky was wonderful and embracing, inspiring none of the terror I had felt before. No, I whispered softly to myself and to the goddesses. Please, no. She has to be alive. She has to see this. She deserves to see this. The ponies in New Appaloosa were coming out of their homes and shops where they were taking refuge. They were all staring up at the sky, seeing sunlight for the first time. Most seemed shell-shocked, but slowly many began to smile. A few specks of color swirled through the bright blue above. Some began to drift downwards, chasing each other. Pegasus ponies from the world above the cloud curtain drawn by the phenomenon. What, what just happened? I heard a buck ask somewhere to my left. I think Ditsy Doo just saved us, a mare responded. I watched those pegasi fly down towards New Appaloosa, hesitant, curious. The brightly colored pegasi didn't look like enclave ponies. They didn't wear the dark colors of the enclave, nor move like they intended to attack. They ain't bad ponies, little pip. Calamity's voice whined in my memory. If most of the ponies up there saw for themselves what's going on down here, they'd buck the damn enclave 
and pony up to help. I hope so, I thought. Mai's falling back to Ditsudu. Silver Bell had stepped forward. I was nudging her gently, whimpering. Poke. Ow. M M Mommy? Oh, goddesses. Please. No. Behind me, a young colt's voice called out. Ma! Did you see it? Did you see it? Derpy saved us. And... And Derpy's hurt. I know, Trolley. The colt's mother said softly. I saw. She doesn't deserve this. I cried out in prayer. My vision blurred badly, and Ditsy Doo continued to not move. <laughs> Please! A shift. A slight flutter in her eyes. One rolled to meet Silverbell. Then, Ditsy Doo whispered something. Almost unintelligible, but that sounded to me, despite her missing tongue, a lot like, Sorry, love. Mommy's sleepy. I collapsed, crying harder than ever, but now the sobs were of relief and joy. She was still alive. Mommy! Silverbell jumped and hugged the ichor-coated ghoul fiercely. Unable to lift her hooves, the pegasus limply wrapped her wings around the rapturous filly. Mommy! The little unicorn gushed happily. You made everything so pretty! Sunlight poured over us. Towards the horizon behind us, the toxic rainbow was breaking up and fading away. Silverbell had climbed onto Ditsy Doo, her hooves slapping or slipping against the ichor bleeding out of the dying Pegasus's many wounds. I had wrapped her in a magical cocoon and was floating both of them towards Ditsy Doo's store, where Pilot was perched just outside on a rain barrel. We just needed to get her inside, I was thinking. Lay her down next to Pyrelite. Find some bandages. There will be bandages inside. There has to be. It's absolutely everything. I am sorry, Zenith was saying. I tried to keep her inside, but your daughter can be evasive. Are you coming home now, Mommy? Silverbell begged. Miss Zenith is okay, but she's not a mommy. Little Philly lowered her voice, whispering to a ragged, ghoulish ear. And she's kind of creepy. Zenith's eyes widened for a moment, then coated with steel as she gazed away. Silverbrell's words becoming another blink in her conviction that she was unfit to be a mother of her own child. I winced a little. I knew Silverbell meant no cruelty. I could only imagine how strange and remote Zenith had been. She was still wearing her zebra stealth cloak. I imagine she spent most of her time with the Philly Invisible to avoid trouble with the townspeople. But those words had done damage, nevertheless. Looking Axtons, Zenith offered, Have you considered training her in the Fallen Caesar style? I found myself wondering about Zenith's upbringing and her former tribe, that her response to an evasive child was to suggest honing those natural talents with an art of killing and a capacitation. Ditsu dismissed the offer with a shake of her head and hugged Silverbell close again with her ears, wings. <clears throat> My pip leg was clicking, but I couldn't tell if the radiation was from the Pegasus ghoul or the puddles of irradiated water. I suspected that Ditsu was still shedding minor levels of radiation even after the sonic rad boom, but not levels which threatened the unicorn filly. Nothing that Radaway wouldn't cure. And right now, they needed to be able to hold each other. The click clicking jumped as Pyrelite landed on my head. Unwilling to wait for us to get inside, the Balefire Phoenix began bathing the wounded ghoul in a golden green radiation. Nah, -uh, Silverbell insisted, responding to Zenith's offer. I'm gonna be a painter, see? The lavender filly pointed, and my eyes followed her hoof. One of the nearby boxcars had a crude but colorful portrait of New Appaloosa painted across it. This wall has a mural. I cantered in a circle, really seeing New Appaloosa for the first time since my last visit. 
The painter was not alone. The child's paintings decorated many of the train cars around me, as well as barrels, carts, and anything else the folk of New Appaloosa would allow Silverbell to beautify. I could see the progression of her skills from one storefront to the next. Between the sunlight and the colors of her paints, the whole town felt more inviting than any place in the wasteland. The light sparkled off the irradiated puddles. The warmth of the sun massaged me through my coat. I could feel the bright rays touching my soul, the sunlight breaking through my defenses, and the clouds of pain and loss that layered my heart. The breath of that sun rekindled hope and made all the darkness of my day before seeming bearable. My heart twinged, wishing Steelhooves was here with us, wanting him to see this. A gruff-looking pony with a spiked mane and a cutie mark of a skull, impaled by a bloody dagger, galloped past me, a shotgun in his mouth. My gaze followed him as he reached one of the Enclave Pegasi. She was just staring and starting to get up when the buck reached her, rearing up and slamming his hooves into her head driving her back down against the ground. And stay down! The Pegasus's visor was broken, and I could see her purple eyes staring upwards at him in shock. The buck leveled the shotgun at one of the Pegasus's wings, keeping a hoof on her head and an eye on her deadly tail. I heard a clatter of metal as other Pegasi in ominous black carapace armor emerged from a pile of rubble that ten minutes ago had been a tool shed. Shadows blocked the sunlight above me as three more Enclave soldiers flew in over the wall and hovered overhead. All of New Appaloosa stood in silent awe of the sun. Foles and the elderly were stepping out of their homes to marvel at the sky. But the Enclave Pegasi had lived above the clouds all their lives. They had grown numb to the warmth and wonder of the sun, forgotten how to notice it. All they saw was the town that had once again struck them a devastating blow. This battle wasn't over. Zack, Zack. I crouched in the doorway of absolutely everything, as beams of colorful light struck the doorframe and dissolved Bitsy Dude's front door into a mound of slag. The heat coming off the metal door seared my coat. Outside the door was chaos. We were fighting in the sunlight. It felt terribly wrong. Disgraceful. The little pony in my head wondered, and worried, hoping that the good ponies of the town would not come to associate something so generous as sunlight with the ugly hurt of battle. I fumbled tel telekinetically, trying to get my ear bloom in my ear as I fired back with little Macintosh. Applejack's trusty revolver was my only firearm I had left. I realized with a twang of loss that both my sniper rifle and the zebra rifle were still sitting in a crate somewhere in Manhattan, if they hadn't already been looted. Missing objective has not changed. A stallion's voice boomed through the Enclave's military frequency. I was almost certain it had to be coming from one of the downed raptors. New Appaloosa was being attacked by a dozen of Enclave soldiers, rather than hundreds suggesting that either the pegasi in those raptors were trapped inside, or that beyond the city walls, the Enclave was having internal struggles. We are here to disinfect the equestria of this terrorist encampment. Fly steady, soldiers. For the Council. For the Enclave. The black-armored pegasus darted behind an overturned pedal trolley. One of my bullets splashed into a puddle behind her. Another buried itself in the trolley's woodwork. The Pegasus flapped her wings, rising up to fire again. Ditsidu's griffin bodyguard had produced a lightning rifle and disappeared upstairs. Clamity was further inside the store along with Pyrelight, both tending to Ditsidu as Silverbell fetched medical supplies. I glanced back to see the Lavender Filly balanced precariously on several boxes as she tried to reach a key sitting on an upper shelf. I caught the filly and the keys as the whole shelf came tumbling down, spilling cameras and teddy bears everywhere. Distracted, I gave the attacking Pegasus an easy shot. 
She took it. I grunted in pain as part of my flank barding heated up. But the Canterlot police barding protected me from severe injury. Crack! White hot lightning arced from the second floor of window above me. The Pegasus mare screamed as she dropped. Her black, magically powered armor fried. The mare inside was probably still alive, but without its spell matrix, her army was. Her armor was too heavy to move. Beyond, I could see the bodies of the raider-like buck and the purple-eyed enclave pegasus. They lay there together, having traded lethal blows. Her purple eyes stared out lifelessly. Her body was impaled with the blade on her tail. Trolley, get inside, now! The voice came from somewhere outside to my left. I slipped out of the doorway instantly alarmed. I had seen too many foals die. The weight of the bottled ashes pressed against me through one of my saddlebags. I wouldn't allow anything else to happen to that little colt. Trolley's mother, whose straw sun hat and floral dress were soaked with irradiated rain, stood protectively between her colt and one of the Enclave soldiers. She had no weapon, but she stood firm, shielding her colt as she leapt from where she was covering, cowering behind her legs, and ran for the nearest door. I took aim at the Pegasus with the magical weapons on the Enclave Buck's armor crackled. Please, can't I just go a day without having to kill another pony? The little pony in my head pleaded sadly with the wasteland. A streak of blue and white struck the ground between the mother's legs and the buck, just as the Enclave soldier fried. The white pegasus with a mane and tail of a multitude of blues had landed, facing the enclave soldier, her mouth open, the sentence dying before it could be spoken, as one of the beams of lethal energy struck her square in the breast, the other searing through the mother's sun hat, blasting it into ash. Blam! Blam! Click! My shot staggered the enclave pegasus, one of the bullets piercing his armor, as the white pegasus mare crumbled to the ground. From her distressed breathing, the shot had torn and possibly vaporized one of her lungs. I found myself calling out for Velvet Remedy before I remembered she wasn't with us anymore. The Enclave Pegasus froze for a moment, staring through his visor at the mauling white Pegasus, stunned. Commander, we have citizens here, another voice called out from the Enclave's military frequency. Suggest withdrawal for a shutterfly operation. I scrambled back beyond cover reloading little Macintosh, as a familiar khaki-coated buck with a vanilla mane raced out of a nearby train car and fell to the side of the white pegasus. One of the trio of young heroes whom we had met at Fluttershy's cottage. Some pony helped me get her to candy. Sparks and the ring of metal on metal erupted across the pegasus buck as she came under fire from a rooftop. I looked up to see a scared Maneless mare in raider armor, firing railroad spikes from what looked like a homemade steam powered rifle. The town's mayor, Railwright, had taken cover behind an overturned workbench, a bundle of spikes between his teeth, prepared to reload. The voices poured through my earbloom, meeting unexpected resistance. Not like previous encampments, there are fools here, families. The Enclave soldier pivoted towards them, opening fire. A second black-armored pegasus swooped overhead, raining a cluster of magical energy grenades down upon the mayor. I focused, magically redirecting the grenades back at the attacker. They exploded with a frenzy of multicolored light, ripping the pegasus bomber apart in the air. Blood and entrails sputtered down on rail right. I felt nauseous. The bloody white intestines glistened in the sunlight. This is Commander Winter of the Raptor, Nimbo Stratus. Remember, these are the terrorists who supplied Red Eye with the Mega Spell, used to murder hundreds of Enclave citizens in the cowardly sneak attack. The unprovoked slaughter of Harbringer and so many of our brothers and sisters is a day that will be burned in infamy. The voice of the Enclave commander frequently growled. I was struck with the uh, Ditchotomy between 
what they told their own soldiers and the propaganda they polluted the equation wasteland with. And their flagrant use of illegal and horrific warfare tactics shall only strengthen our resolve. More of my Canterlot police barding heated, the top layers melting as two magical energy bolts struck me. Another hit Ditsidu's sign, obliterating her offer of free wasteland survival guys. Searching for the source of the attack, I spotted a pegasus in black armor, landing on the balcony around Turnpike Tavern. Someone else spotted her too, as a green field of telekinetic energy wrapped around the pegasus, lifting her up and twirling her around. The little pony in my head winced, realizing the unicorn's mistake a moment before the pegasus spread her wings and pushed herself out of the telekinetic sheath with a single flap. Spinning her around had merely helped the targeting spell in her armor locate and lock on to the offending new Apollosan. And even as my own targeting spell locked onto her, the Pegasus vaporized the surprised unicorn with a rapid fire light show from her integrated magical energy minigun. Blam, blam, blam. I squeaked little Macintosh's trigger as quickly as I could. Several of the bullets were stopped by the Pegasus's black carapace, but one struck home in her wing. The Pegasus lost control of her flight, spinning wildly before crashing into the new Appaloosan crane with a sickening crunch. Fly steady! The, Pegas the Enclave Pegasus rebounded from the metal neck of the crane and crashed to the ground below. My eyes traveled upwards, along the crane to the platform it held dangling above the city. A platform stacked with railroad rails. Some pony else had a similar idea. Caramel colored magic flashed across the bolts beneath each side of the platform and the chains snapped free. The platform swinging down and dropping a mess of rails onto the pegasus just as she was getting back to her hooves. The sound of all those metal beams striking the ground and metal rolled across New Appaloosa by the percussions of Hell's own orchestra. I cringed away, covering my ears. And do not forget that your actions here make your brothers and sisters, your families back home, safe once. Red? What are. The transmission in my ear bloom suddenly went dead. Out of the corner of my eye, I spotted a unicorn mare weeping over a fallen guard buck. I saw her expression shift from inconsolable loss to red rage as an enclave soldier landed in the streets nearby, nuzzled the unmoving body of another unarmored or armored pegasus. I knew what was about to happen. A little pony cried out a warning that never made it from my own lips. As the unicorn floated the dead buck's mach uh, machine gun battle saddle into the air, took aim, and fired. The first bullet struck true, puncturing the enclave soldier's armor and scrambling his inside. But the kick of the battle saddle knocked it out of the mare's magical hold. The gun sprang wildly, several bullets ripping through the poor unicorn herself. She stood, blood pouring down her side and flank, her eyes wide with a look of un uncomprehending surprise. For at least three long seconds after the battle saddle had clattered to the ground behind her. Then she swayed and fell over the body of the guard buck she had been mourning, life fleeting from her eyes. Death was breathing over New Appaloosa. The Grim Reaper ponies were having a feast. Stop it! Calamity cried out, shooting through the doorway past me as two more Enclave soldiers flew over, firing swaths of burning plasma into the streets below, drawn out by the screams of ponies burning alive in agony. Clemmy's voice was filled with rage and sorrow, sounding heartbrokenly fragile as he bellowed, Stop killing ponies! Horrified, I commanded my targeting spell to ignore the hostiles and instead start locking on a friendly targets. The ponies in those plasma fires could not be saved. I could, couldn't bear to hear them suffering. I wished Velvet Remedy were here, yearned for her anesthetic spell, but all I could offer were bullets. Blam. Blam. 
My targeting spell allowed me to aim perfectly through the flames. One shot each. To the head. It was a mercy. And I hated myself for it. I felt like my coat was writhing. Wanting to crawl off my own body in disgust. Attention, Enclave personnel. A new mayor's voice burst in my ear as the Enclave military frequency crackled to life once again. This is Acting Commander Red Glare of Raptor Nimbostratus. Commander Winters has been relieved of his command. As of this moment, you take your orders from me. The fury of the battle waned for a moment. Many Enclave soldiers paused to listen and reload. This battle is over. I am invoking Shutterflight Protocol. All Enclave forces are to withdraw immediately and assist. And just like that, it was over. The Enclave soldiers stopped, turned their heads to the sunny blue of the sky above, and then, almost as one, flew upwards and away from us, like demons fleeing hell. It took the ponies of New Appaloosa several minutes to stop firing at them, but the Pegasi were fast, and all but one had managed to get out of range before the townsfolk could strike them down from below. That single mare came pillowetting downward, like a falling shadow. She hit a rain barrel, smashing it, her own blood tinting the irradiated water as it washed away from her. I fell against the doorway, my strength leaving me. My revulsion and horror gave way to a numbness that felt even worse. Beneath that numbness, I realized I was shaking. Ditsy Doo had saved New Appaloosa. Without her, this town would be nothing but a smoking crater. But all around me, the dead and the crying drove home that this victory was not without grievous loss. I watched Calamity land next to the fallen white pegasus with the fantastic blue mane. Her side was rising and falling. She was struggling to breathe, but still alive. As I watched, I noted that she wore a belt strap with a pip buck dangling from it. It was locked, of course, doubtedly taken from the corpse of a previous owner. Unable to open it and wear it herself, she had slung it over her like it was a canteen. Calamity helped the khaki pony slide onto her, slide her onto a piece of sheet metal and carry her towards Candy's clinic. There were several more ponies converging on the same building. Candy had already run out of room inside and was directing every pony to line up the wounded on the porch surrounding her clinic. I shifted my gaze, looking into the darkness of absolutely everything. Detito's griffin bodyguard was still perched on the upstairs window, watching the ascending pegasi like a hawk, or, well, a griffin. Alarm shot through me as I realized no pony was tending Ditsy Doo. I could see her in the back, illuminated by Pyrolite's glow, unmoving. Unmoving is okay, right? The little pony in my head asked frantically. Doesn't mean anything. Ghouls don't move much. Steel hooves would stand still for hours. Oh, goddesses, steel hooves. Sarah was sitting beside the ghoul's cot. The Belfire Phoenix wrapped in her forelegs. The little pony in my head stopped crying over the Malas Ranger long enough to wince, remembering just how unhealthy it was for the filly. I pray to the goddesses that Ditsy Doo hadn't lost her entire supply of Rataway right when her delivery wagon was annihilated. I tried to pull myself to my hooves, intending telling to gallop over to them, but my legs refused to bear my weight. I glanced as the medical display on my EFS, believing I hadn't been wounded that badly in my battle. My armor had protected me, yes, but I was exhausted, emotionally brutalized, and I hadn't slept since before the funeral. The light of the sun was the only thing giving me the spiritual strength and energy to keep going and even that had been spoiled. And then, the light began to dim. I lifted my gaze towards the sky. Far above, the Enclave Pegasi were zooming back and forth across the circle of blue above us, drawing parallel lines of clouds 
across this opening. Strangely, I remembered an old story about skaters scouring in ice during winter wrap-up. But then, as the thin lines of clouds began to thicken, expanding towards each other, filling the gap of blue between, I realized it looked more like some pony slowly closing the blinds over a window. The Pegasi were once again locking up the sky. Shutter flight. My thoughts felt warm and melancholy, and slightly fuzzy, like the little teddy bears I wanted to hug as I went to sleep. Medical treatment at Candy's was one part butterscotch rum. Calamity had found me collapsed in the doorway, trying to worm my way towards Dizzy Doo, and had insisted on hauling me to the clinic. I had protested. I wasn't wounded enough to warrant him taking attention away from the other ponies, but I hadn't needed to worry. I had been given a cot about half a block from the overfilled clinic, been stripped of my barding, I had been given a canteen of healing that smelled strongly of butterscotch. The sounds of moans and crying drifted over me like layers of smoke. The air smelled like alcohol, blood, and burnt flesh. In the cot next to me was an elderly green-coated earth pony. He had stepped outside to see the sun, only to have his hind leg melted. Candy was telling his plaintive grandchildren that their grandpappy was in a deep sleep and not to be woken up again for a long time. The young filly wrapped her forelegs around the slightly younger colt and held him as she broke into sobs. I wanted to sob too, for steel hooves, for velvet, for the little filly whose ashes I kept in a jar, for Ditsy Doo, even though I still had hope she was alive and would survive this, and for all those who did not. But I couldn't. I was too tired to cry, and there were too many ponies around. The little pony in my head told me that my pain, my grieving, was a private thing. I could cry with calamity, or homage, but not here, in front of all these ponies. Calamity laid down next to me, staring into the dirt, his hat tilted sadly. He wasn't crying, not externally at least but my friend couldn't hide his pain. My heart reached out for him in a way my legs refused to. We'll fix this, I assured him. Calamity stirred. He didn't look at me. Instead, he looked towards the row of pony-shaped lumps under stained sheets. You can't fix Dad. His voice was flat, defeated. I wanted to bury my head, hide away from that voice. My mind conjured the image of steel hooves, walking solemnly against the sheet-covered bodies, bearing solemn witness to the fallen. He should be here, my little pony mourned. Then my cruel imagination envisioned steel hooves as one of the bodies under the sheets. I choked on a breath and had to look away. I gazed over at Candy, my eyes tracing the white earth pony and her yellow and pink striped nurse's dress. I had fancied her once, and she was, indeed, fancy a bull. But now, I only regretted that she was not Velvet Remedy, whose skills were badly needed. Or homage. That was a selfish wish, but I allowed myself to have it anyway. Homage could heal and comfort me far more than a canteen of weak healing mixtures and rum. Homage was my son. Her mere presence could warm me. Her soft words, words would banish the dark shadows in my head. Her tongue, looking down to... My thoughts were interrupted by the approach of Railright. The gray and black stallion was accompanied by the bald, scarred mare I had seen with him before. Her radar armor revealed just enough to make out a cutie mark. A black, needle-like dagger, dripping blood. My eyes narrowed. You gave Red Eye the belly of fire bomb. I spat as he approached me, opening his muzzle to proclaim something. His muzzle snapped shut abruptly. The air between us felt brittle, 
and charged with tense, unseen energy. Calamity stood up, leveling a dark look at the mayor pony. The bald pony cut in, either oblivious to the discord between myself and the mayor, or unable to give a shit. Wow. I get you now, she announced. Feels damn good to be a goddess damned heroine for once. Fought on the side of angels and all that. Who the hell are you? I gouged. She looked like a razor. Sounded like one too. Stiletto. She grinned savagely. Shattered hoof raiders. Although, I guess we ain't raiders anymore. We're protecting the waste for fun and profit. God's ponies. Shattered Hoof was hiring out mercenaries, meshing with the spike main pony I had seen earlier, and Ditsy Doo's Griffin bodyguard. Last I knew, God had been consolidating her forces, but also contemplating what to do with the bad eggs amongst them. Maybe this was her solution for those ex raiders, not vile or trustworthy enough to meet her talons, but still undesirable enough to have around the house. And you blew it up for him. Railwright said stonily. He threatened homage with that bomb, I hissed. Then realizing the name meant nothing to him, he threatened all of Ten Pony Tower. Thousands of ponies. Your actions put me in a tight spot. I needed to show Red Eye that New Appaloosa weren't against him. Railwright glared at me for a moment, before glancing around. Besides, would you have preferred I kept an undetonated balefire bomb sitting around here in town? No pony would do that. That would be insane. I felt my nerves jangle with energy. Despite my exhaustion, it was taking extreme effort not to put a hoof through his face. Besides, it would seem like y'all are working for Red Eye anyway, Railwright whispered. The stallion smiled oddly. From wiping out his slavers, to wiping out his enemies. I couldn't have seen that coming. Extreme effort. Calamity bristled, neighing warningly. And he seems to have plans for you. What now? Still, uh, Stiletto had apparently grown bored. She trotted away, sitting down and sharpening her, the spikes on her armor her eyes watching the skies. What do you mean? I asked, not sure I wanted the answer. Railwright shrugged. Not sure, but I've come to tell you that you're allowed back in New Appaloosa. He told me. No point in keeping you out when Red Eye considers you an asset, not to mention how unpopular that decision has made me against the DJ Pwn3 love and herd, Railwright grumbled. I'm rather lucky to still be mayor. Stiletto clopped over and poked the mayor with a forehoof. Griffin's inbound. Looks like the big boss. I turned my eyes toward the sky. The cloud cover had been completely restored. With over a hundred pegasite working on it, the breach had been sealed in under half an hour, catching the wasteland once again into heavy gloom. A far off flash lit up the undersides of the storm clouds, echoed by a second flash a little closer. This flash illuminated a flock of griffins, two smaller ones flanking the flock leader as she guided them towards New Appaloosa. Heavy raindrops began to fall. Cold, clean water sprinkled from the blackened clouds above. Raindrops rippled the surface of the irradiated puddles, broadening and diluting them. The soft metal clatter of the rain beating upon all the metal boxcars sounded like funeral drums. The rainstorm that the sky had been threatening began slowly. But soon, Candy was corralling every volunteer she could to move the wounded inside before they were completely soaked. Calamity moved from one end of my cot, then stopped, glaring at Railwright and Stiletto. One of ya is gonna grab that one end over there and help me take her into absolutely everything, or so help me. Yeah, yeah, Stiletto quipped before picking up the opposite end with her teeth. You're a tough buck. Very impressed and shit. Shaken, 
even. I wasn't alone in my trip to Ditsy's. Absolutely everything had one of the larger interiors in New Appaloosa, and over half a dozen cots were floated, carried, or dragged inside within minutes. Well, that was an anti-shortcut, I mumbled as my cot was placed near the doorway to Ditsy Doo's room. The ghoul didn't look like she had moved. Silverbell was curled up on top of her, sleeping fitfully. An emptied packet of Rataway lay on the floor beneath them. A little bullet of glowing orange juice, dribbling from the sleeping filly's muzzle. Otherwise, paralyzed radioactive glow ensured that Ditsy Do had the room to herself. Is she going to be okay? I asked Pyrolite. I was surrounded by ponies, yet there was no one else to talk to. Xenoth had disappeared again. The soft glowing bird hooted gently. Once more, I wished Velvet Remedy was here. I wasn't sure would be, she would be any better with ghoul physiology, but at least she could interpret Pyrolite's musical notes for me. I felt a hoof punch me in the shoulder. Why didn't you tell us who you were? I turned to see the Amber Mare and Khaki Buck, whom we had helped at Fluttershy's cottage. The attacking hoof was from the Mare, who managed to look both starstruck and cross at me at the same time. I found myself blushing. The little pony in my head quickly insisted the extra heat in my cheeks was from the rum and definitely not the embarrassment or being hit by a pretty mare. Oh yes, the canteen. I should drink more now. Easier to respond. Yep. I was gushing all about the Wasteland heroine and you were right there and didn't say anything. The mayor protested. Was she mad at me? I'm not... I tried to argue. I mean... I'm just trying to do the right thing. Like any pony would. Oh yes. The mayor chimed, rolling her eyes. Like any pony would. Because just any pony would risk their life trotting to the home territory of the most dangerous monsters in Equestria to set off a balefire bomb and clear them out. She smirked. My eyes widened. My muscles stiffened in alarm. What? How do you... But... I felt my words stumbling over each other. Of course, every pony knew. DJ Pwn 3 had seen to that. But there wasn't something that I should be appraised for. Yeah, the buck added. Way I see it. You can't have an undetonated megaspell bomb in the wasteland without some evil asshole using it to murder a fuckload of ponies. I flinched. But not only did you get rid of it, so it couldn't be used to hurt any pony, but you wiped out, what, hundreds, thousands, of monsters that hurt ponies for sport. His voice oozed sarcasm, as he added, just like any pony would have done. My mind reeled. I felt as if my world had been nudged off axis. I felt messed up. The memory of what I had done merged into a vision of steel hooves, standing on erupted ground, and slashing claws that tore through his armor, severing his neck. A stallion three cots away from me woke up and began to scream, thrashing violently. Two bucks moved to him to hold him down, while Calamity pulled painkillers from Ditsidu's stock, tossing bottle caps on a counter. Beneath the stallion's screams, I heard Mayor Railwright announcing that Ditsidu's medical stock was being confiscated for emer emergency use. The little pony in my head stomped at that. I couldn't imagine any pony, much less Sweet Ditsy Do, trying to sell medicine at a time like this. But I still wanted the mayor to ask permission, now that he could. The door banged open, letting in a spray of rain as two colorful, unarmored pegasi pushed into the crowded, crowded store. The stallion's screams began to weaken as Calamity jabbed him with a syringe full of painkiller, and pushed the plunger down slowly with a hoof. One by one, the other ponies turned to stare, their conversations dropping into hushed tones or dying away. In one corner, a wife continued to sob over her bloodily bandaged husband, but even she stole a look. I'm sure they brought her in here, the first Pegasus, a sunflower yellow mare with an ex extensively curly crimson mane, and a smiling sun for a cutie mark, said before stopping. 
her eyes widening at the stare she was receiving. <clears throat> Behind her, a buck with a coat of color of jade and a short-cropped teal mane looked like he was about to drag her back out with a poofy tail. Are you crazy? He hissed, trying to keep his voice low. But it carried anyway. They're going to kill you. They've probably already killed her. For all you know, this is their kitchen. The mirror gave a nervous smile, a bit of sweat falling from her forehead as she looked over the staring unicorn and earth ponies. She lifted a hoof in a timid wave as she threw a harsh whisper back at her companion. They can hear you. The Pegasus's manes Mare's eyes looked back and forth over the room, before coming to rest on a nearby bookshelf. School special. All pencils and notepads, 50% off. She read softly before turning to her companion. Not a kitchen, unless you think they're offering a hearty school Philly salad with a scrumptious pencil cobbler for dessert. I heard a few grudging chuckles. To me, the comment just brought up disquieting visions of Arbru. They're joking about eating fillies? The khaki buck breathed, appalled. They're joking about what they think we're like, the amber mare answered. At the stomp, the jade-colored buck turned to the pegasus mare's mane in his teeth and gave her a tug. We need to go, he insisted with a stomp. The air's poisonous down here, remember? She'll be dead before she can fly again. Hell, we're probably dead already. I'm not dead yet, a weak voice called out. A white hoof raised in the air. I shifted to spot the wounded white pegasus, and according to my pit buck, the air's not poisonous here, tracker. Of course it's poisonous, the jade pegasus tracker spat back. You're using that thing wrong. You always have. They don't work when you don't wear them. Actually, I wanted to interject, feeling a moment of pride in my expertise. Radiation monitoring still worked, just like the radio, although, admittedly, health monitoring wouldn't. My thoughts fell apart before I could... before the desire could manifest as more than a vague wish. Between the medicine and my exhaustion, I was flirting with incoherency. If the air was polluted, the yellow pegasus challenged, how come all these ponies are still alive? They've grown resistant to it, the buck shot back. Don't you ever listen to the science station? The argument was interrupted by a rust-colored pegasus in a black desperado hat. One, Clamity said authoritatively. There sure as shit are places where the air is poisonous, but this ain't one of them. Two, y'all can't go back anyway, so best be thankful for that. The buck's eyes widened in alarm, then narrowed. The white pegasus gasping. What do you mean we can't go back? She wheezed. I've got to go back. Those soldiers were attacking unarmed civilian ponies, elderly and foals. When my senators hear about this, they're what now? Clemente turned towards her, his expression gentle and a touch remorseful, but his voice firm. The Enclave of Senial down here reported it. Y'all are on the wrong side of a flutter sh shutter flight, and have interacted with the locals. Officially, or unofficially, y'all are contaminated, Clamity informed them sadly. Officially, y'all are probably dead. Don't listen to him, the Jade Pegasus burst out. By the weekend, the Clamity of uh, the Enclave will have delivered condolences and new birth approval certificates to your families. Clamity continued. Sunlight. Morning frost. Don't listen. Tracker pushed forward. A few of the ambulatory uh, new Appaloosans stood up and took a step towards him in response. He's a dashite. His words are all lies and infectious ideas. Clamity stared at Tracker, unwavering. You're just trying to tell you like it is. Save you the heartache of trying to go back. You think I don't recognize you? Tracker accused. You're Deadshot Calamity. You murdered your troops and fled beneath the clouds to escape punishment. 
I've seen your wanted poster. Calamity sighed slightly, glancing back towards me as he muttered under his breath. His story rewritten yet again. Looking back at the buck, my friend said reasonably, Believe what you want to, but trust me when I say, you don't want to be heading back. He looked at the two Pegasus mares. That won't end well for any of you. We've got to try. The white Pegasus with the incredible blue mane and stated as she held up her pit buck. I assumed she was morning frost. I've got recordings here. I like her, the amber mare next to me stated, echoing the little surge of my own heart. Good girl. Are you saying they're innocent? Tracker sneered. Then why did you run? Clemente lowered his head and pulled on one of the straps of his battle saddle. The other straps came undone, and the whole battle saddle just slid to the floor. I don't deny I'm a dash at, he said, though the rest of that and take issue with. But then, if I escape justice, how do you figure they branded me? Yeah, that don't make much sense, assessed the yellow mare. Sunlight, I presumed. Maybe the Enclave lied. They can't lie to us, Trekker said in a voice that used you used to state basic facts to slow children. They're the government. I sensed Clamity's desire to face hoof radiating off of him. This Enclave, it didn't make sense to me. My own thoughts swam, clutching for an anchor. I realized it was past time to ask my friend about the ponies we were facing. But first, I needed to rest. Sleep. More than that, I needed time to, to breathe. To mourn. My heart was bleeding from too many deep wounds. Hurt tomorrow. Help today. But today was tomorrow, wasn't it? I lost track of the dialogue between the Pegasi. With Calamity among them, I felt like a poor friend to have done so. I tried to perk my ears and recapture the conversation. After they did nothing about that dragon, the citizens wouldn't stand for them to be passive about Splendid Valley Massacre, Sunlight was saying. Can't ignore me. I'm a member of the party, Morning Frost insisted. Last time I followed you two anywhere, Trekker fretted sourly. With friends like you, I gave up my ears plastering against my head. I lifted my gaze to the spinning fans that hung from the ceiling of absolutely everything, and tried to let everything go. I could hurt today, couldn't I? Cry today. Fight again tomorrow. The first tear stung my eye, then slipped free and rolled down my cheek. I tried to blink it back. Not here. I should be alone. Hey! The Ember Mare said, startled. She put a hoof on my shoulder. Hey, don't cry. Please, don't cry. I turned to look at her. If you start crying, then I'll start crying. And it'll be a whole messy crying thing. Her voice had sincerity behind it. I wasn't the only pony hurting. And not the only one here trying to hide it. I gave her a weak smile. Steel hooves always hid his pain. The pony in my head reminded me. Suhu's was always silently strong for every pony. But that wasn't necessarily a good thing, was it? My soul felt like I was swimming in darkness, barely treading water. And if I didn't let out the tears, I'd drown in them. Who are you, ponies? A voice from the far side of the room spoke out. Before any pony could answer, the avalanche started. You're the Enclave, right? Why are y'all attacking us? Was that Celestia up there? Why'd you take her away? Some ponies were curious. Most distraught. There was an ugly overtone or undertone building with each question. Now every pony just calm down, Calamity said loudly, raising a hoof. Ain't you one of them too, Calamity? Somebody asked poisonously. Calamity stammered. Now, y'all listen here. I heard a thud and a high-pitched yelp. It sounded to me like it came from the next room. 
Some pony in the crowd pointed towards me. Past me. Other ponies turned. The steadily raising voices pattered out. Dittido was standing in the doorway. My heart soared as I, as I was seeing her upright again. It was like she was her own little beam of sunlight. She looked weak. Frail. Like she wasn't standing quite on her own power. Her body canted slightly, making me suspect she had been leaning on an invisible zebra. She was alive and awake. One of her eyes tilted towards the ceiling fan. But the other stared at the ponies gathered in her shop. Slowly, lowering her head, dropping her chalkboard, and then rode on it. Lifting it back up for every pony to see. Be nice. Absolutely everything reserves the right to buck out ponies who aren't nice. P.S. Healing supplies now for muffins later. Smiles are free. Every pony was quiet. Then, the amber mare, whose name I realized I still hadn't learned, walked up to Ditsy Doo and gave her a thankful hug. Within seconds, Ditsy Doo was surrounded by ponies, hugging her and professing her thanks and their relief at her recovery. So much so that an invisible zebra was no longer needed to hold her up, nor even able to stand nearby.